Okay, we should be ready to start very soon. There was one question about big data and business. And uh, I, well, I see the person thank me for my response. So maybe my response uh, um, was valid. I pointed out we will. I, I, I'm not quite exactly certain which applications I go through because there's not enough time to go through everything, obviously. But um, I was going to go through commerce, which has got a large amount of AI attached to it. And la in, this spring, I had a course on, a, on this uh, transformation of industry. And there I did banking. And I have a link to the banking YouTube videos. But there's not as much AI in banking. All right, so let's just get a little started here. That will probably prompt people to turn up. Okay, I thought I'd start with the uh, class uh, website. And as you, in the, uh, hopefully you all use this a little. And um, it has on the, uh, in the menu, the uh, different topics of the class. Uh, and um, including some we haven't come to yet, like cloud computing, but uh, other sports, physics, uh, ones, the ones we're doing today, uh, health and medicine. And uh, the, the other thing we have is the course lectures and organization, which has the weekly lectures. And we're now at week six. I have not posted the homework yet, but the video for this week is the pre-recorded videos on health and medicine which I actually recorded most of them in the spring, but I did a significant update in the last week. So there, these are new, these videos have been remade. And if you, um, I was thinking I should point out areas you should go to if you're looking for particular applications. So the, with this week, the areas we've gone through the application areas are the physics Higgs boson, the survey we did of 51 applications, sports and now health and medicine. And I listed here the five areas from spring where I have both YouTube um, videos and Google Slides. And I will probably do commerce and update it when I do it, but there's not so much updates to commerce as there is to um, as there is to health and medicine, because health and medicine's made is making more rapid progress at the moment. Commerce is pretty clear what's going on in commerce. It's still a revolution in that uh, we haven't uh, seen the complete the change from the full extent of the change from bricks and mortar to electronic commerce, but uh, I, there's not quite as much change in the core technologies as there is in health and medicine. All right, so after that, we'll go to, um, we'll go to, uh, I will do like I usually do, which is do a summary of the following week's videos. And so here I have a summary of health and medicine. So before I do that, are there any questions? All right. I'm assuming there are no questions.
<laughs> I guess I have a quick question too. I'm not sure if you've answered it already. Um, when will we have like some idea of grades for the class? Yeah, I was prosecuting the graders. Who would probably? I don't know any. Gregor, do you know when they're going to be grading? They should be graded by now. I apologize. Oh, uh, they haven't communicated to me about the grades at all. Okay. Well, we'll send out a message. That's a very good point. I apologize. I did bug them a few days ago. Um, uh, since since I have already spoken, one of the things that you uh, guys may all want to do is, is, is start thinking about uh, preparing for your projects. Despite the fact that not all applications have been uh, developed yet or presented yet, uh, that's independent from your choice. You can pick even a topic that hasn't presented yet. Um, uh, uh, take a look at the previous um, presentations uh, um, or proceedings that Jeffrey pointed out to and make sure you don't underestimate this. Um, in my view, you should be starting this weekend um, to take a significant look at this and, and uh, start preparing at least an outline for the paper um, with uh, you know, related research and, and uh, what you may want to do and so forth, because you have to also submit this to the TAs and they will help you or guide you in the um, fulfillment of that particular process. Yeah, I agree. It's almost inevitable that we cannot do all the applications before you have to decide. So, because as is a non-trivial effort, you sort of have to decide early on before you're actually doing it. So that's why I actually, I have here some, um, I summarize what I hear, what I put in the, in the class website, which is the, um, so the, the, these are again, list, these are the same links as in the class website. And they're just meant to tell you where you go if you're interested in these areas. And um, these are the five application areas which, um, I did this spring where I have complete YouTube, which are correspond to the Google slides that are next to it. And if you want, if you sort of, we can just sort of spend a few minutes on these. If you look at banking, banking, the AI part of banking is called FinTech, financial technology. And it's incredibly well-funded area. The amount of venture capital going into FinTech is enormous. And um, there are lots and lots of startups in that area. And um, that's, that's, that is reviewed, but they say they don't, unlike some of these areas have some very um, obvious, uh, exciting AI applications. I don't think that's quite so true in banking. In banking, a lot of the developments are not actually the AI, it's just the digital platforms. Digital platforms are, revolutionizing banking because um, that's even easier to put online than it is for commerce because um, money can flow money does not necessarily you don't have to ship banknotes back and forth you can ship uh, pointers to money back and forth commerce is um, got lots more ai including the possibly the most important ai for commerce is um, Recommender engines, which advise, uh, which examine customer behavior and translate that into actions for the customers and actions for the for the sellers. One of the most interesting things we did in spring were the um, automobile industry, or the which is rather symbolically labeled the mobility industry. There is a, uh, a pretty interesting assertion that there is no longer really an automobile industry or even a transportation industry. There is a mobility industry um, where Uber is part of the mobility industry giving ride hailing uh, as is Tesla and General Motors and things and railroads and stuff. 
And another here, another discussion here, which um, illustrates the change of industries. The one well, I've listed here, transportation systems. So that is actually where a lot of, well, if you go to the mobility industry, it's dominated probably the most obvious AI is in self-driving cars or augmented driving cars where you have enormous amounts of very sophisticated image processing. Because oh, well, generalized, whether, whatever the particular sensor be, it is effectively producing an image to guide the car as it drives along, moves along car or plane or, or, what, or what, have, what have you, truck. Um, so there's huge amounts of AI in mobility from that point of view, but there's also an equal amount of AI in transportation systems. And this is sort of a, a new type of industry which, which effectively controls, controls transportation. It, it includes the software that I say Uber uses to try to track where its customers are and where its drivers are and match drivers to customers. It will include um, traffic analysis, which is get, getting increasingly sophisticated. And so just as you have um, control towers controlling aircraft, you effectively hadn't expect to have the same thing controlling all transportation. Um, space and energy are a shorter presentations and there is a lot of progress in space and energy. Energy of course is becoming green and space is being revolutionized by commercial entry into the space field. And there is quite a lot of digitization, especially in the energy field because the in energy you're gonna have a whole distribution of power plants because you're you can even imagine your um, self-driving car with its battery is part of the world's energy system. And so there is a lot of new sophisticated, what you might call it. The grid is normally how you talk about the electrical supply system. The grid is typically meant to be a bunch of power stations and, and distribution, and, uh, distribution networks. But they say you can have the, the, the new version of the grid is very distributed with solar panels on houses or buildings, I should say, and you say even ones in cars, all, li all linked together. And different parts of that system is absorbing energy at one time and giving out energy in a different time. All right, so that's there are a set of pretty interesting applications there, which you can choose from. And then um, three, which are not there because I didn't really do them. Um, well, I did do uh, are, are these, I, I listed here what I would consider the three major AI applications. Uh, we did though do, uh, we've done some of these already and we also did some of these in the, um, in the spring class, but not from this point of view. This is saying, well, let's look at applications that are based on images. And um, there's, so that's obviously there's this huge set there. We've already discussed that for self-driving cars or say augmented driving cars. But the another huge uh, important area is um, natural language processing, uh, voice to text, one language to another language. These are incredibly um, important hugely lucrative with lots of money going into them and possibly the most sophisticated applications because I think natural language processing is a little harder than image processing. Um, it's a bit more erratic, the, the language. And then the final area I have here is the, um, is the recommender engine, which is um, how, how one, uh, how one drives e-commerce. E-commerce is driven by, by the AI that um, analyzes what people are doing, such as what they're buying or what websites they're, um, they're accessing and uses that either to tell the website provider what to provide, so you have dynamic web pages and, uh, and or tells the user 
and who, what they, where they should go. Another area which we could cover is what I personally actually and Gregor work on is time series using deep learning. And there's also a related area where which is sort of time series where you take giant computations like simulations of fundamental physics or astrophysics and you replace that simulation engine by a deep learning network. Those are called surrogates. All right, so we will cover some of these in the rest of the semester, maybe all of them. All right, so are there any questions? And so here I've set the scene. I will now go on to health and medicine. Um, I wonder if there are any questions at this stage. Just check that I have. Yeah, this is, this is being recorded. Okay, so we'll get started on the rest of health and medicine. All right, so these were neat slides which just telling you where we are in the class. So now let's get on to health and medicine. And this slide here is not very easy to talk about it because there's a bunch of, bunch of uh, phrases and it is set up to look like a hype cycle. If you remember, Gartner has hype cycles and uh, this comes from a different company who sort of copied the Gartner uh, shape and listed various uh, technologies here, starting off at the, in the technology trigger or innovation area with neural implants and DNA infused jewelry. And then over here in the path of enlightenment, enlightenment we have personal digital health records and uh, what, some, what is called in these lectures, the internet of medical things, which include monitors. There's also AI to try to capture the doctor's voice so that the, um, we can uh, record the doctor's visits more efficiently. Okay, digital twins we work on a lot at Indiana, that's producing models of, um, of organisms. That's, they're pretty non-trivial because uh, uh, cells, which are the, the fundamental entities which build our organisms are pretty diverse and there's no trivial model for them. So you have, it's quite how accurate these digital twins are and it's not so, not so clear. Anyway, there are a bunch of topics here. And some of these will be covered in the, in the following slides. Sorry, I should have gone on to come to present mode. This uh, slide um, points out that uh, one sort of obvious, actually this is obvious point, but is non-trivial. It is that companies like Google, who, which is dominantly search or Amazon, <coughs> dominantly commerce and Apple, dominantly uh, hardware, phones and watches and things and, and Macs. <coughs> they have a huge involvement in the healthcare industry. And there are two reasons for that. They all have large infrastructures, uh, which in the case of Apple would be on the client side, watches. In the case of Google and Google, well actually Google might have Fitbit on the client side, but it's dominantly cloud. Amazon is cloud. But more importantly, they have, they have possibly the best expertise in AI in the world. And actually, although it only has Google, Amazon, and Apple, you should add Microsoft and Facebook to this. There, there may not, certainly Microsoft's as involved as the other three. Whether Facebook is, is not quite certain, but it is not, it has a non-trivial involvement, <coughs> involvement in this area. So we're getting, we're in an area, <coughs> an area with a lot of players. And these large tech, tech companies obviously have huge power. I mean, as far as I know, Google, 
Google has the world's best AI group there is. I mean, it's just significantly larger and more talented. And Facebook, Microsoft, and possibly Amazon and Apple somewhat below, they all have comparable or only a little, a little less powerful AI groups. And so as there's a whole lot of new AI to be designed, you would expect these companies to have a huge involvement because they, 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 they pay these AI people a lot of money and it's very hard for actually universities and other players to compete unless they're doing startups maybe where the reward might be more, more greater. All right, so yeah, well this chart fortunately has Microsoft, which I say I think clearly should be part of the big tech and healthcare discussion. And it just lists in a little more detail uh, the capabilities of these major players. Um, and if you look at the weaknesses, they're just a bit disorganized and because that's sort of inevitable in a time of great change. And um, all of them have consumer trust as a threat and data security. And the main other threats they have are competition with the other big tech companies, namely wearables. Uh, Apple has a clear lead in the Apple Watch, as far as I can see. There's nothing to compete with that. Um, and in clouds, we know Amazon is the leader, but Microsoft is only a little way behind, and Google is a, a non-trivial player. Although, and I don't think, and Apple is not really a player in that field. But it's watch and associated health function is, uh, in my opinion, a pretty powerful entry into this field. Um, this uh, slide here just tells you, tells you the, a little bit about the uh, types of companies that uh, organization that uh, are involved and as we know, unfortunately, in the healthcare system, insurance is a major part of the system, and there's a huge amount of effort and money goes into insurance. And so, in part of the, the this, uh, there's a large number of companies which uh, are involved at the, in that part of the field, and there's actually quite a lot of innovation in the insurance area, in being able to uh, optimize insurance co coverage and identify risks quicker and things. That's uh, all related to insurance. Then you have the actual healthcare providers. And uh, well, uh, we have here, well, locally there's a CVS and a Kroger's, Walgreens, Walmart, so they're probably right aid is here, I don't know, and, and Target. So we have um, retail, retail clinics, hospitals, which is IU Health around here. And there's also a growing amount of telemedicine. The pandemic has made an enormous uh, jump, I mean, it's forced an enormous jump in telemedicine. And so these are um, like um, companies pioneering telemedicine are rapidly expanding. And I think most people think that as the pandemic winds down, which hopefully it will soon, some parts of the change will preserve. Then we probably we will still use Zoom a little more after the pandemic than we did before. Also, we're likely to use more telemedicine than we used to. Um, the, by the way, there are two terms we've come to learn, telemedicine and telehealth. Uh, Telehealth is a more general area and where telemedicine is where you do remote uh, medical, um, medical analysis and things like that involving the doctor. Whereas telehealth would be your uh, Fitbit, Fitbit sitting on your wrist, sending data back to the cloud. That would be an example of telehealth. Uh, so, and then we have uh, companies which uh, making various things. I don't know some, well, I know Fitbit, I know GE, which is a giant medical instrument company. Livongo was just recently, I believe, purchased by Teladoc in the, in the, medical, in the um, telemedicine area. Philips has, a, has work on sensors. 
and um, I say I don't actually know the others. And then we have what uh, well, they call them distributors, which includes Amazon, McKesson, I know, um, and so on. So these are different parts of the whole health ecosystem, well, they could co correctly call it an ecosystem. Now, the main purpose of this slide is to say we will not discuss clouds. And I've told you that it's not that clouds aren't important, they're incredibly important, uh, but they're just there. And all of these, this healthcare will involve clouds, namely the dominant, like all of telemedicine is effectively people, doctors, um, um, medical devices distributed around sending their data back to the cloud where the cloud aggregates the data, compares it with other people's data and helps uh, patients and doctors make good decisions. So the cloud is essential, but it's, I don't think in say in health or medicine it has any special features. It's just gonna be sitting there training neural nets and inferring things from neural nets, but, uh, and keeping track of all the world's electronic data, which is a huge amount in health and health and medicine. So you will not find much more discussion of clouds in, the, in this talk. In fact, we will have a unit on clouds, but to say clouds are now very, very um, powerful and mature, and uh, we're just exploiting them. But this plot here shows that um, hospitals, like most of US industry, is increasing uh, the use of clouds. And actually hospitals are behind most of industry, because most of industry this was November 2019. So most of industry probably was 80% into clouds in 2019 or 85% because it's 94% in 2022. So, so hospitals are actually a little um, low and only having, um, well, they claim by now essentially, because this is a year after this survey was done, about half of the hospital Workload was on clouds. I don't, I'm not a great expert on cybersecurity, but um, there is no doubt that health and medicine is incredibly affected by cybersecurity. And there are many aspects of that. The most obvious is an attack. You read about um, various people, in fact, there's an article that the um, this morning about an organization, a company called UHS, must be United Health Services, had a, a violent uh, cyber, cyber attack which forced all their doctors to, to do everything with paper. Um, and here is data breaches, which is an aspect of cybersecurity. And you can see the number of breaches is measured in one per day, because these are monthly breaches that are, which currently are running around 30. A month. So, cybersecurity is very important, and there is some AI involved in in combating cybersecurity, in both recognizing the attack and devising ingenious defenses. But that's not an area which I will cover. Uh, the other aspect of cybersecurity is that these uh, security and privacy issues mean that it's often pretty hard to find health and uh, health and medicine data. And so it actually cramps a lot of the research in this field. I mean, I, the example I sometimes give is Fitbit. Fitbit must have data from tens of millions of people sitting back in their cloud. As far as I know, that is not available to um, to researchers to analyze, to look for patterns and things like that. Um, even though I don't think Fitbit is using it extensively. So there is not just cyber, it's not just um, privacy issues. It is, um, although they're present for Fitbit data because the Fitbit data from everybody is private to themselves. It is actually proprietary nature, Fitbit, is in the battle survived and it doesn't want to give away its crown jewel, which is its data. 
Although we know that some companies like Twitter do give away, well, they don't give away, they sell their data. You can buy tweets and then Indiana is pretty advanced in buying tweets from uh, Twitter and using them to do interesting analyses. All right, now the next slides are all hordes of different examples. And the, oh, yeah, so you will find more detail in the recorded lectures. I just selected some of the slides here. So a pretty obvious and, and actually I would say already successful application of AI is in what you could call diagnostic imaging. They'll be taking images from medical instruments like MRIs, CAT scans and things, and analyzing them with AI to find out uh, anomalies. And um, the reason why that is uh, likely to succeed is that we have this, if you, I mean, image analysis is the area where deep learning has made the most progress. Well, the two areas are text, natural language processing and image analysis. And um, the image analysis can actually be taken over without much change. So you to, and take the analysis developed for say self-driving cars uh, with this, all these very sophisticated um, neural nets. You can use those neural nets with little modification, say to scan for cancer and things like that. Um, so there are many, many examples of that of which are fewer in these uh, images. And um, if for this type of application, the AI has lots of value. It um, probably is more accurate. It is certainly much faster. I mean, it says here that for 420 x-rays, uh, pneumonia related x-rays, they did, did those in two minutes and which was over a hundred times faster than a team of radiologists. Um, and at the simplest, you don't, you, you don't even have to actually produce the deep, Analysis, you may not wish to have your cancer decision um, decided for you by a machine, but they can at least remove, uh, remove a lot of um, uh, images which have no information. And so that they, these top radiologists can actually put their energy into the, into the, scan, into the images of greatest value. Um, so that's, of course, the, doc, the hospital realizes saving, um, possibly saves money by doing that because they're using the highly paid people to analyze important images, not unimportant images. And it claims here the radiologists will still keep their jobs, they'll just do a better job. I think that's probably true. Um, and it says, points out here that uh, FDA, which has to approve all these uh, things. We see that for the COVID vaccines. Um, and uh, radiology is uh, growing faster than other applications. Uh, and there are many companies, well, this.ai we do a little later on. And <clears throat> another type of application here is eye systems. Um, and so you can actually analyze, you can have automatic analysis of the eye um, to uh, scan for disease and, and uh, presumably cataracts and things like that. And um, here's an example of blindness analysis and things like that. And diabetic ret ret retinopathy, which I can't pronounce, is a well-known problem which uh, can be detected in the eye. Uh, over here we have that they actually um, there's some sort of survey. Actually, I'm surprised that AI for imaging isn't number one, because uh, I think it's clearly actually has more promise, immediate promise than genomics and precision medicine. Um, in fact, I would think telemedicine and AI for imaging are the two, two obvious winning applications. Um, 
The others are not unimportant, but I don't think they're quite so ready for prime time. Now, actually, I heard the talk, which, uh, which is described here by the fellow from Facebook who um, did this. So this is a good example of big tech. So here, the uh, Facebook has a famous AI group called FAIR, Facebook AI Research. And uh, one of the leaders of that in New York collaborated with New York University medical staff to develop um, <coughs> AI by, um, to develop AI for reduce image size by just cleaning up the image and only preserving what's important. And <coughs> here is an example of two, uh, two images. Uh, the one on the, in the middle is uh, the usual image and the one on the right has some AI enhancement and actually looks as though the structure's a little clearer. And, um, but actually all they're trying to do is to um, reduce the data volume by a factor of four. And um, it currently only works for knees, which are of course pretty important in this general area. But uh, this shows how, um, uh, how uh, AI can impact almost everything, because AI can just optimize everything. And so you have a process, and that process has um, analysis, but it also has data gathering. And so you can use your AI to do better data gathering. Um, I say it also really emphasizes the role of big tech, because these this person who was was just is not a, the person in Facebook was not a medical expert. He was just somebody interested in using his expertise and, contra and working with the medical doctors. And of course, it's interesting that big Facebook, et cetera, allow, do, they attract good people partly by allowing them to do things like this as well as the, as well as the, as, you know, whatever they do in, the, in their day job for Facebook, such as optimizing the experience, uh, using AI to optimize the experience of people accessing Instagram or whatever uh, task they're solving. Um, so there is a set of AI to do what's called clinical decision support. So, um, this is a little, well, it includes, if you like, the AI for imaging, but uh, you, ha you have a whole bunch of data. The doctor has to look at the data and um, make decisions. And so by integrating AI with the electronic health record, you have the opportunity of an enormous amount of autom automation and also in comparing different EHRs, I mean, this is one of the important problems and or issues. Almost certainly, you, I mean, big data works by having big data, which means you have, just a minute, so by, by, by getting a lot of data together and looking at the patterns from that data. As this data is not easily available, it is not easy for, people outside the medical system to do this. I just see there's a, a um, yeah, you, there's a question about agriculture. I think agriculture is very interesting. It is, um, um, it is an, typically an image-based analysis. So it has two times. I mean, Agriculture has lots of interesting features and there's a lot of work in agriculture. Some of it is you might say there's an internet of agricultural things. We said there was an internet, internet of medical things, but there's internet of agricultural things because you're in, you can install sensors across the world, across the world's uh, agricultural um, regions to, to, to measure moisture and, 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 every, and anything else. The other way you can study agriculture is through uh, drones, which photograph the crops growing and therefore can detect area, uh, crops that are impacted by drought or, or flooding or, 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 or disease. So I think you will find 
plenty of work on agriculture and is certainly an, a possible area to work on for the project. All right, let's get back to clinical support. So um, whenever you, another issue, unfortunate feature of, of medical things is money and lawyers, namely, um, there's a lot of, um, uh, of uh, cautious decisions which tend to maybe increase the amount of effort needed and the AI system can possibly prevent that. And um, they also possibly fit well with some push towards what you might call value-based care that uh, you get paid, the doctors get paid for doing things that are valuable. Um, and so there's a comment here, the, the hospitals are penalized if they have, um, if they have too, a record of their patients coming back to hospital too often. But then anyway, AI can almost certainly help in that area because anything like this, which is, a, which is effectively analyzing existing data, the existing data tells you what the history of the patient is and how the patient's readmission or few uh, later illnesses are related to their current illness. And so you can presumably be able to do a lot of optimization, which would be impossible for, for anything but a truly experienced, insightful doctor. Here is an area which has a nice name, which is not totally clear what it is, to me, in my opinion, from but it's called digital therapeutics. So digital therapeutics in sort of as a word, which sounds as though it's called like digital health, but it uh, describes a certain set of, of AI and digital enhanced uh, processes that are, or products that are offered, uh, offered today. And it's not a huge, I mean, 9 billion in the space of medical is not a huge number, but it's, because uh, uh, it says here, the chronic diseases cost the US healthcare system $3.3 3 trillion in 2018. So a mere 9 billion is a um, small part of that. But if you look, here's a nice, um, there's some players in the field. Again, we have Livongo, which we had before. Um, but here you have um, a, a, a description of the types of things digital um, therapy gets involved. And so they involve um, computer generated analysis of patient activities so that they can, um, they can help the patient do things which are good for them and um, monitor that the patient does what they're meant to do. Um, so that's, uh, there's a class here that I think they even have things like for opioid uh, treatment and things like that. So digital therapeutics is, uh, is um, a, an interesting area with a lot of players. Here, this is just a random example from a company called Geisinger. And um, it's a similar type of thing to the, I say this, if you look at these slides, they're mainly um, one or two slides on 50 different things. <coughs> because that's what this world is. It's, uh, you, you, in fact, there's this, you know, people are so ill, or there's so many people, each of which get each illness many. So the number of times every illness has gotten is lots. So you can afford to have specialized systems that effectively focus on individual illnesses. And um, there is, a, so the here the machine learning is looking at, uh, at uh, tomography scans and um, by reducing the analysis time from nine hours to 19 minutes, that's a factor of 50. Um, they can do lots of things. They can both speed up the um, throughput, but in this case here, they identified a woman who, uh, who was misdiagnosed and um, 
was actually had some sort of hemorrhaging where she's thought to have had a med medication problem and she was, um, her, her illness was addressed. Anyway, it is actually just, in both commas, just AI analyzing images. And of course it uh, is trying to identify images that are likely to require immediate action. And in particular, the algorithm is trying to detect bleeding. I'm not quite certain how the AI would, uh, would detect bleeding, but I can imagine, I mean, this doesn't seem impossible that there is a signature of bleeding. And you obviously, the, those cases have higher priority. Um, here is diabetes. And this particular comment, it points out that um, there is a sort of social issue to, with some of these um, um, algorithms in that uh, different ethnic groups uh, uh, react differently. And so when you have an algorithm that's trained on, in this case here, people from in Israel, it is not so likely to work on, on uh, people in the US or especially um, uh, minority groups in the US. So, um, and, then, and then points out that Israel has less diversity in its population. And so its algorithms may not, may not be immediately applicable to the US. But um, uh, it's obviously, the, I mean, but that's the sort of detail. It just is describing that issue here. Well, we, if you remember, we, one survey said precision medicine was the highest um, uh, opportunity. And in some sense, it, it, if you, what is precision medicine? It is that you customize the treatment to the person. Now, as the person is defined by data, and, you, and you, so if you have a, an AI system, that AI system can take the person's data and, uh, and deliver perhaps more effectively personal, personal recommendations as to the appropriate um, treatment for a particular um, sim set of symptoms. And here we have uh, this particular precision medical system uses genetic, um, uh, genetic aspects to help uh, oncologists, cancer treat doctors make treatment decisions. And um, they claim a significant increase, uh, a factor of two almost in uh, lifetime, life expectancy from this type of analysis. Um, and another one at the top is just adverse drug reactions. You can, that I think is rather clear that you can do that. You can look at the, you know, there's so much data, it's probably rather pretty hard to decide for an individual doctor with an individual, patient like me who doesn't see the doctor so often to remember what, what, or what I should or should not take. And so that's an obvious. AI ought to be able to make these types of decisions much more precise. Um, now again, because of this image, um, image focus, the cancer, um, applications are uh, particularly uh, powerful. And um, it points out that um, we, that cancer is responsible for 38% of, of errors in, in the US with half of those errors resulting in death and, and lots of money to in malpractice and things like that. So this shit points out that being precise in your diagnosis is very important. And so precision medicine, this type of precision medicine, which is just one part of the general idea of precision medicine has some, um, has great value. <coughs> Here is a nice article which I found from uh, Microsoft about cervical cancer, which I gather is uh, curable. And um, 
unfortunately has greater impact in developing countries because it's not caught by automatic screening. And, um, and you can see, see that from the plot. Uh, if you look at the country plot on the bottom right, it shows you that the incidence of cervical cancer is very low in the US, which has automatic screening, which removes, catches that early on. And um, so it claims that this was speeds up uh, analysis and therefore can be applied in places like India, where there is presumably uh, less widely deployed uh, services. So they claim, well, I remember we were talking about money. We had three, three trillion as a, some sort of uh, measure of the severe diseases in the US. And so here we have a saving of uh, 150 billion, which is non-trivial. And we also get this number we saw before of about a factor of 100 speed up. We saw those in some of the other uh, image-based uh, AI applications. Here's a company which we actually was mentioned earlier on as an, being um, approved by the FDA. Um, and it is, uh, um, it, it is looking for, 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 measure, for signals of stroke, large vessel occlusion, and um, again, by finding these, these uh, things very early, it's, um, can shorten the time to get it immediately addressed. And this particular software is um, in 300 hospitals. And um, we have pictures here of the, uh, well, it's a pretty simple picture. We have the CT scanner looking at your brain. It runs through a deep learning algorithm and the deep learning algorithm sends it off to the stroke doctor. who The stroke doctor presumably then knows what to, um, to look at. And they compare that algorithm with the much more complex. Um, uh, this is in the, on the, in the um, where it has CT scanner technologist, radiologist, ED physician, neuro, neurologist, uh, intervent interventionalists. So it's a more complex manual process. Um, and this is a typical, I think this is, as you see, these are all particularly, you know, like, large rational occlusion, that's a particular problem. And so you look at all of these slides, they're just particular focused problems where you, you make the right software and you train, the, presumably you train your deep learning network to recognize the characteristics of large rational occlusion. Here's a set of a few slides on uh, robots. Well, we know, <coughs> so that's pretty different. This is not, well, these are of course using deep learning because the robot will use deep learning to look at you and interpret its input and things like that. But it is not directly deep learning in the same sense as the previous slide was. And um, here was a nifty robot to actually um, draw blood. And we know that drawing blood is sort of slightly non-trivial. You have to stick your, the needle in the right part of the arm. And um, it had, um, we uh, gather that the, the, it had an 87% success rate uh, for um, over the 31 participants. <coughs> and it claims that that is probably better than what uh, usual providers do. So the key is that here we have, you know, here are these huge numbers. Just drawing blood, you can save $4 billion a year. Uh, because you will more easily find the right place to stick the needle in. So that's pretty interesting. Four billion dollars saved by finding the right place to stick the needle in your arm. Well, okay. Here is a here is a um, more sweet application. This is in South Korea. Uh, this is a doctor. This is robots to comfort you. And so this is emotional support robots. And um, 
have been used, uh, I think not surprisingly, in a children's hospital first. And um, so uh, th th this has, um, th these robots can also do uh, other uh, administrative tasks, but the main purpose of this particular robot is uh, emotional support. Here is uh, another one which was motivated by the uh, pandemic, uh, actually one of the early ones, which is to um, just take, and then we have another example, actually more sophisticated one following of the same idea. You want, uh, you want to increase the volume of people, you can screen quickly, and you want to do it in a way that involves, which is automatically socially dis distanced, so you don't want to keep your, have your healthcare professionals next to your patients. So you just do, you just uh, do most, everything you can remotely, not necessarily like telemedicine or a long way away, but you maybe have the patients drive to the hospital, then they go into a, a tent and do their analysis inside the tent where they do not have to interact with the healthcare professionals. Okay. <clears throat> Yeah, this is the other one, which is a little more sophisticated. It kind of, it's a more recent announcement from MIT, and there's a very well-known robot company, Boston Dynamics, and they have um, built a, a more sophisticated version of this robot for uh, essentially doing all the necessary uh, initial measurements of uh, vital statistics, um, and. Uh, there's a picture of the, this, so they measure skin temperature, respiratory rate, heart rate, blood oxygen, saturation. These are actually things which are typically done by Apple watches and, thing, and other wearables. And um, this is just in an experimental stage. So it comes from a university hospital collaboration and with industry, Boston Dynamics. And here's a picture of Dr. Spot. Here's Dr. Spot in the middle, surrounded by the mask team that uh, built, built him or her. Okay. You see they have a tablet for interacting with the patient at the front. Here's a fun one. All right, so here's another. This is only 16.5 billion. But so this is 16.5 billion spent on, spent on beautification. Um, so that's what's called cosmetic surgery, surgery designed to make your nose straighter or your ears taller or thing or whatever you would like to do to make yourself look better. And you can just as there's all this news about how you can use GANs to generate image face, face false images. So that you can uh, use this type of AI to determine beauty. So you can then analyze what type of procedure will lead to what increase in beauty. And it appears that in 20 uh, plastic surgery conferences, um, most had a session about AI. And <clears throat> So they uh, appear, well, they do, they, they do what you'd expect. They're trying to quantify facial attractiveness if you're doing operations on the face. So this is a pretty broad field. And again, this is the image-based part of, um, of um, deep learning. Well, here is a much more straightforward one and um, <clears throat> This is machine learning to analyze DNA. So you take a blood sample, you run it through your machine learning, and it has built into that machine learning a thousand diseases, which have a particular genetic structure. And um, it is meant to, it's cost $2,000, but um, it is meant to find things which otherwise would take a substantial greater time. And so, we will come back, I'm not certain quite when, to discuss more on genetics. Uh, opioid addiction, one of my colleagues in a project, which I actually I was the funded project, we looked at, uh, at uh, 
AI technology to, to um, help uh, opioid addiction. And um, this is a, a device here which measures breathing patterns to see if the, uh, they have the, the impact on breathing or respiratory depression, which is associated with uh, an overdose of opioids. And of course, this, this is an example of a personal, what's called PERS, personal emergency response system. So you have your device. It says, hi, hi, doctor, Jeffrey is in trouble. Come over and, and cure him or some, whatever they, he wants to say. And uh, it has a look. <coughs> okay, and there are various other similar ideas. So these are wearables or some type of device like that. And um, I'd also suggest there are other ways of curing pain other than taking the addictive opioids. Um, so opioid addiction is obviously still important. Well, here this has an exciting title, uh, but what does it mean? It actually means that physicians I'm not even certain it's actually addressing burnout. What it is, is addressing administrative tasks. Even though I complain about the paperwork I have to do, if you replace my paperwork by a machine and said, Jeffrey, you have to study deep learning 24 hours a day, I think I might get more tired, not less tired. I may not enjoy the, the, um, the um, administrative work, but it's actually less intellectual effort than trying to worry about the uh, dropout rate on my deep learning algorithm and why it's uh, not converging and things like that. And there's a set of technologies here which are designed to do administrative tasks. And uh, there are three here which are all effectively voice related technologies. Um, Amazon, Notable Health, Nuance, and Suki, there are four of them, I think I might have said three. And we have some of them given with special, I, I think I've chosen Suki as the example. Yeah, this is Suki, but the, you can also do the other, the, the full presentation has the other, other contenders in this field. And this is really simple. We know doctors can't write because you can never read their notes and uh, you speak to a doctor, all you need is a highly reliable uh, voice to text system. And of course, the voice to text system has to be taught all these funny names like CT and, um, and opioids. So there are going to be some words which will not be typically learned terribly well. So you obviously have to learn those, especially teach medical terms to this, uh, to this uh, neural net. Uh, but otherwise, it's probably similar to these other neural nets, BERT or GPT-3, which are used in, uh, otherwise. Uh, <clears throat> so anyway, this again has, this is probably more accurate because you can read it automatically. Although, of course, we know that, but we know there's been a huge improvement in the voice to text um, accuracy. And typically, I think today's computers are more accurate than humans. Um, and it uh, it sort of says there's a factor of four um, improvement. And um, the claim is that for every hour of patients, they usually spend two hours on paperwork. So we drop that paperwork by a factor of four. So uh, this three hour thing now takes an hour and a half. So we can double the number of patients. And it's sort of interesting, it doesn't use Google Assistant, which is Google's uh, voice to text uh, technology, which is really advanced. It has the best technology there is in the world, but probably not optimized for medicine. Uh, but it, Suki does store things on the Google Cloud. As I said, all of these systems use clouds. I just, it is so pervasive, we don't discuss it yet, typically. Uh, here is this, um, uh, probably the next two slides on genomics. Um, there's a random thing here about funding. It points out that, um, well, we like billions of dollars in this, in this class. Uh, here we find that in the first half of 2020, half a billion dollars, sorry, $5 billion, half of 10, $5 billion 
were were uh, spent by investors in startups in six months. So that's a billion dollars a month. And you can see there's been a pretty healthy investment over the last uh, that's five years here, starting in 2016. And uh, there's a slight decrease in 2019, but the COVID virus inspired people probably to invest more, not less than before. Um, but anyway, that's a slight aside. Uh, it's sort of interesting to point out that, uh, and you can see actually why if I was um, um, an investor, which I'm not, I would certainly consider digital health as a really promising area. Because there's so these money numbers in health are so huge, and so many of the techniques are integrated. <coughs> All right, so here is um, a plot about genomes, and there are several comments to make about genomes. The first is some aspects are positive. You look at 23andMe, which is what I subscribe to, although Ancestry.com it appears a little bigger than 23andMe. But those two together make up 80% of consumer genomics. And um, number of customers tested across the world is, I assume these are cumulative numbers. And uh, that's now cumulatively 20, 26 million people. Um, but actually, Although it's going up, it's actually leveled off because people have got realized that there's only so much you can do. 23andMe took my sample, but it hasn't actually told me too much of any interest. It says I have more Nathanthal genes than, I ought, than normal, and it's identified hundreds of people who are fourth cousins or something, but other than that, it doesn't tell me anything useful. Um, but here's a little comment about why there, this might be true. So usually we discuss total successes, but it's worth noting that um, if we look at uh, health and medicine. We, uh, five years ago, we expected all the breakthroughs to come from genomics because we were able finally for less than a thousand dollars to sequence the full human genome. And um, what's the problem? Why can't, why isn't that producing a breakthrough? The reason it's not producing a breakthrough is largely that life's complicated. Namely, a single genome at the moment is not clearly a signal of anything. So we can't, we have not designed a deep learning network where you feed in the genome and out pops. All right, here's Jeffrey's genome. He is now subject to the following 23, he has, a, he already has the following 23 diseases and he should, should be, he's more than likely to get another set. So they do that for some diseases. You can identify where people are more likely than not to have some problems, but it is very imprecise. And the trouble is that the disease is not signified by the DNA. The DNA is a part of the, the ecosystem that determines whether you get the disease, but I don't think your cancer, you can't say this person has cancer. You can't look at the DNA and say this is person has cancer. And so it appears they claim that gene therapy for rare single gene disorders is successful, but that's, that has to be customized, which we already saw that everything was customized. And, um, but for many diseases, they're very complicated and the gene is just one of the, one thing that determines exactly how that disease will, will progress. So I think that's quite important to, to note that uh, Genomics is exciting and important, but it hasn't quite been the revolution, whereas deep learning is exciting, important, and the revolution, because it really does work on particular cases, including with genomes. I mean, the way you're gonna use this genome is probably gonna feed it through a deep learning network to decide whether you're, what the, whether you're likely to have a rare disease. And, 
Here's another example of the administrative work, um, which was a uh, AI software looking at medication errors. This was a retrospective study looking at past uh, decisions, but um, found, it found 11,000 medication errors. And well, it found 11,000 and 92% of them were correctly flagged as the, the incorrectness was correct. <coughs> and so, well, it only would save 1.3 million. That's not so much compared to the billions and trillions we've had in the past. Um, <coughs> so anyway, he's actually saying we better better publish such articles. Um, okay, so that's we're getting near the time to stop. So let's stop now. I remember where I got to slide 37. I'll continue next week. And are there any questions? So the purpose of these, <clears throat> these talks is A, for you to learn about the opportunities in health and medicine, which are enormous, and also possibly to help you uh, if you want to do a project in that area uh, to, um, to, um, <clears throat> to choose it. I mean, if you have any questions like agriculture, just, just ask me that. And I think I, I'm pretty knowledgeable. I think I understand lots of things I don't talk about. So if you need any, if you, you can also send me emails, Jeffrey, tell me what, tell me about AI in, uh, in, in the oil exploration or something like that. I can probably help you. Um, and you can also look at these various resources. I gave you a rich set of resources. It's, uh, I mean, this AI, as you see, AI is used everywhere. All fields, all industries, and all human activities are being changed by AI. So, all right, so that's all I have. Any, any questions? So if there are no more questions, I'm going off the air. Thank you very much. And Thank I will you. put the Zoom on, I will process the Zoom and put it uh, online.